course, I never miss a chance to promote what a Gettysburg alum has done. And one person who took action after this battle was a Gettysburg alum. And that alum was David Wills. Uh, David Wills uh, thought that it was uh, a necessity and appropriate to find a final resting place for the thousands of Union soldiers who perished on this battlefield between July 1st and July 3rd. That is a grim photograph, no doubt about that. But beginning in October of 1863, the battle again occurred in July, beginning in October of 1863 and finished in March of 1864, some 3,500 men just like this were disinterred and then reinterred in the National Cemetery, thanks to Mr. Wills. Uh, he was largely responsible in bringing together the property as well as the funds for a cemetery that was about 17 acres. And I think one reason why it's such a powerful place is that you'll see that the Union soldiers who were buried, that their graves um, are all the same height. Uh, there is not a grave that stands out. There is nothing there that should suggest rank or suggest hierarchy. It is the layout of that cemetery that conveys, I think, a spirit of equality. Now, Bob has actually already had his Gettysburg address. Ah. It was his installation address. Somewhat was, longer than two minutes, though. It was somewhat longer. But here again is, you know, the mistake when you have a historian interview you. Because what did I do? I always go to the evidence. I go to the record. And so you can, in fact, you can watch Bob's speech. I did this morning. And I thought that this would be an opportunity for you again to reflect upon Boy, those words seem like you said them years ago, does it not? Uh, it was, it's been an interesting year, my <laughs> interesting, first year as president. Interesting year. So one of the things you said, I love this line, and I love how you keep repeating, repeating the word sacrifice. That's a, a nice rhetorical uh, technique. So I'm quoting you. The land around us is marked by sacrifice. Sacrifice sacrifice offered to perfect the promise of democracy and equality made at our country's founding. I like those words. I like those <laughs> words a lot. We don't hear sacrifice very often, right? Because I've encountered people who are sometimes, I think, um, a little too cynical about young folks. They think that young people are soft. They think young people don't like to hear the word sacrifice. Bob, tell us, right? We know differently, right? We've seen it here, we've seen it else. Tell us about sacrifice and what you mean by that and how young people should rally around that word. Well, Pete, I think we're seeing it in very vivid ways right now. Sacrifice is about putting something above your own self-interest in the first instance. It's a recognition that we can do more collectively, we can do more, we can have greater ambition by virtue of, uh, at least in our, in our aspirations for the society as a whole. And so my notion of sacrifice is in its most vivid form what happened on this land, where people gave up their lives for a cause that mattered to them. But I think we're seeing in the streets of Minneapolis, in the streets of New York, a different form of sacrifice, where people are working collectively in order to have their voice heard and to change the society that they're inhabiting. Uh, a belief that something needs to be different and the world isn't oriented the way our students want them to. And they're willing to expend of themselves um, a sense of energy, a sense of commitment in order to get to that bigger, broader goal. And I think in that is embedded the notion of sacrifice. Again, the extreme sacrifice is giving up life. Um, but people sacrifice in time. They sacrifice in a narrow conception of self-interest in service of something bigger and broader. And I think what the installation address was seeking to do there, Pete, was to remind people that we have both a special opportunity and a special obligation here by virtue of the history of this land um, to give our students the opportunities to engage in that form of sacrifice, to figure out more about themselves, what they want of themselves, what they want of the world, to equip them with the skills to be able to effectuate change, um, and ultimately to free them in a sense. Uh, to undertake that sort of important work. You know, again, back to Lincoln's call to um, perfect the democracy. Right. We also have a strong connection to Dwight D. Eisenhower. He came here uh, in the midst of World War I. Uh, he oversaw the training of a tank corps. I think there was like only one tank out there, but nonetheless, <laughs> they called it a tank corps. And as many of you probably know, uh, that Dwight D. Eisenhower came back 
to Gettysburg or Adams County, uh, where he resided, and also was a trustee of Gettysburg College. And so um, I find great inspiration, not just in General Eisenhower, but in Eisenhower as a president. And of course, like any president, they're not perfect. Uh, and so, you know, I, certainly he is a, a figure that people love to debate. But I think there's also something in Eisenhower, in his service and his duty, that I would, you know, interested in your insights, what we can gain from him, from his example. Well, talk about a person who believed in sacrifice. Yeah. I think his whole life was a commitment to something bigger and broader than himself. But I also think that he offers us a lesson that is related to the lesson of Lincoln in many respects. And that Eisenhower believed in the importance of conversation, of understanding one another, of finding common ground where that's possible. And I think we see in today's political, political environment, Pete, that the quality of uh, political discourse has degraded. And I'm not making a political statement, um, but the capacity of people to speak effectively across difference, to find the places where they agree instead of to focus on their disagreements and to amplify them, um, I think that is making progress harder sometimes in our society. And one of the things I'm fond of saying, Pete, and you've heard me say this, I put these two things together now, Lincoln and Eisenhower in this respect. Um, I want to bring people who are unable to agree here. And I want to show them the battlefield, and I want it to be a vivid reminder of the consequences when we're unable to work through issues. Um, and then encourage them to have the sort of conversation that gives hope to progress. Right, right. I think that this serves as a nice transition to remind you of, again, November the 19th. Lincoln's head is circled. Uh, there is, of course, just a tendency to see every man with a stovepipe hat and say, that must be Lincoln, that must be Lincoln. But sure enough, he's not wearing a hat in this photograph. And I show this to you all again uh, to remind you that the Gettysburg Address was not an address that unified this nation. The Democratic press, Lincoln was a Republican, the Democratic press, they hammered Lincoln. In fact, one Chicago paper said, the great task before us is to get Lincoln out of office. <laughs> right? So it is always important that when we look at today uh, that we don't get cynical because we think that there was a time in which people behave toward each other in a civil way. Uh, democracy, it's a rough business. There's no doubt about it. I'd agree with you. It's rougher than what I've ever seen it. And yet, I feel a great deal of inspiration that I don't think democracy is lethargic as it once was. So I think the importance of education, Pete, at the end of the day, is the opening of a door for the capacity to, as we've been talking about, to rethink your positions, to learn, uh, to expand your horizons, because I think that begins to eat away at orthodoxy, right? And I think the challenge can sometimes be between peace and justice. Why did we have to do what we did there? Was because it, was, it seemed impossible to put the war into the fuller context and bring that reconciliation. But I think with a, and this is an optimistic statement, and I acknowledge it, but I think that with the progress that comes with education, it's one of the reasons you go back to the Revolutionary War. The notion of education was so important in my home state of Massachusetts. Yeah, it was built into the state constitution that John Adams wrote. Yes. I think the promise lies there, lies in that. It doesn't mean that it's easy. It doesn't even mean that it's often going to be successful. But at the end of the day, peace and justice are interrelated. Yes. Uh, because you're not going to have authentic justice without peace. Because in the absence of peace, necessarily, if one looks over the history of humanity, the people who pay the price often for conflict are not the privileged. Right. It's the people who are not privileged. Yeah, and so if you want to reunite peace and justice, they need to be united concepts, but I do think it's gonna take people um, to unshackle themselves from their prejudices um, and to be open to, um, open to alternative views and understandings. Right. And that is the great irony of this historic ground. Right. This horrible battle unimaginable casualties and yet this killing ground did become a healing ground and as you pointed out it's not perfect and we're grappling with some of those imperfections of reconciliation but my god it should give us some hope hope for reconciliation in our own time hope for justice in our own time and and this is the place to come to strive towards that